Hi, everyone. This is Matt Britton, founder and CEO of Suzy, and thanks so much for joining today's webinar. Our State of the Consumer webinar series started way back in March 2020 during COVID, um, and we are still going strong. This is one of my favorite webinars of the year because it's one of my favorite events of the year, the Super Bowl. And today we're going to be discussing the economics and the cultural drivers behind this year's Super Bowl, which is occurring this Sunday between the San Francisco 49ers and Kansas City Chiefs. I personally think San Francisco is going to pull it out. Um, I read this morning that 70% of people are actually betting on the Chiefs to win. So it'll be interesting. It should be a great game. And it also should be a great webinar today. So I'm really excited to dive in. We have an incredible group of guests that are going to be joining us. Um, Ricardo Aspiazzo, who's the VP of Creative and Brand Management at Verizon. Um, my good friend, Dr. Marcus Collins, who's a professor of residence at the Ross School of Business um, and, and it just wrote an amazing book on the impact of culture on brands and today's society. Uh, Jameson Fleming, who's the managing editor of Adweek, a great partner of ours on our Speed of Culture podcast. So uh, our guests are going to be joining us in a little bit. Um, but before we're going to bring on the guests, I'm just going to go through a quick presentation with just some high level data, um, both third party data and, and we pulled ourselves just so you can get a lay of the land of the Super Bowl. For those of you who don't know who Susie is, Susie is um, a software company that deploys market research software for the leading brands in the world, um, enabling major brands at their finger on the pulse of the consumer in real time um, through a pretty amazing software platform we've been building for the last six years. Um, and a big driver of our business has been using our, our own software to create our own content um, to support things like the webinar, which is a great way to add value um, as well as you know build awareness for, for our company. So I want to thank everyone for taking their time um, today during this busy week um, to hear what we have to say about the Super Bowl along with our guests. Um, I will be referencing a study today, which was conducted using the Suzy platform on January 17th with a sample of about a thousand consumers who have watched the Super Bowl in the past. And the sample that we spoke to was census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So as you all know, the Super Bowl is one of the most uh, watched annual events in the U.S. It's actually the most uh, watched annual event. And, you know, the TV landscape um, has really shifted. Um, our, we have a podcast um, called Speed of Culture, and the episode that came out um, this week was with John Steinlauf, who is the head of sales at Warner Brothers Discovery. You should definitely check it out. And he talks about, you know, how the TV landscape has changed, and obviously streaming has been the biggest disruption um, that he's seen throughout his um, long career um, in the television space. And, you know, when you look at linear television, which is just tuning into a channel like Fox or ABC or NBC, um, you know, there's not really a lot of occasions where the country at large is tuning in. We had the Grammy Awards, which happened um, last week, but that's had the declining viewership for quite some time. Really, the only thing holding up linear television is live sports. And as a result, the only real place that advertisers can effectively and reliably reach people on linear television is through live sports. And, you know, there's data every year that says 90 to 95 out of the top 100 shows watched on television are actually um, NFL games or other sports games. And that's amongst both male and female viewers. And as John said during the podcast, you know, sports and live sports is really the only thing holding up the TV uh, linear, you know, model. But he also said that a lot of the major networks um, like Warner Brothers Discovery have multi-year contracts still locked in for things like March Madness and the Olympics um, and the NBA. So I do think that the, the traditional model of viewing TV is not going to go away anytime soon as long as these big networks have the rights to a lot of these live sports events. That being said, what we saw this year um, was Google make a major move towards seeing live sports in a streaming environment as the NFL Sunday ticket program, which for I think over a decade was with DirecTV, um, was then purchased, um, the rights to which were purchased by Google and their YouTube TV platform where you can watch all out of town NFL games and uh, on YouTube TV. And as a YouTube TV subscriber, I have to say um, it was a great experience and they did a great job with it. So I think it's going to be interesting um, to see where we are five, 10 years from now. But as of right now, if you are an advertiser and you want to garner eyeballs at scale, the Super Bowl is really the only game in town which is why they are able to command such large fees, five, six, seven million dollars for a 30 second spot, because there's really nothing else like it. Um, the economic impact of the game and as well as TV spots themselves has obviously felt um, long after it as well. And we're going to be talking about that. So today, there's really three topics that we're going to cover before we bring on our esteemed panel of guests. Uh, first and foremost, uh, where we're watching the game. 
um, what we're watching during the game. Obviously, the game is only part of what people watch. A lot of people are there to watch the halftime show and the commercials, and it's sort of like a American tradition uh, at this point. And one of the biggest uh, events that that most Americans share together alongside Thanksgiving and Christmas. It's kind of one of those occasions. Um, and then some trend predictions on, on one of the big stories and one of the big trends behind the game, which will lead us into um, our our panel. So what are we watching? So first and foremost, the game itself, the physical game, is a huge economic driver. And this year it's in Las Vegas, which is really interesting because many had said for a long time that the NFL would never have a team in Las Vegas just because gambling was sort of so taboo. Um, Pete Rose, one of the greatest baseball players of all time, was banned from the sport um, for his life for gambling um, you know, on sports. I don't even think he was gambling on baseball games. I think he was just gambling on sports in general. And gambling was so something that the, the league ran away from. And now gambling is something that the leagues don't only just don't run away from anymore. They're integrating a lot of its programming. As are the major networks like ESPN, you can't watch a NBA game right now on ESPN without them talking about what the odds are. And I think as gambling has become much more accepted in culture and society, Las Vegas started to become more and more of an option, first for an NFL team to move there. So the Raiders, formerly the Oakland Raiders, now the Las Vegas Raiders, moved there a couple of years ago into an incredible new stadium, um, Allegiant Stadium, right off the strip in Las Vegas. And now the Super Bowl is there, which is a big deal. Um, nearly half a million people are planning to head to Las Vegas to watch the big game. It's going to be a very expensive experience for consumers, which we'll get into. Um, I went to a Super Bowl, for example, in Minneapolis in February, and the prices really dropped because not a lot of people wanted to be in Minneapolis um, You know, in February. Great city, love Minneapolis, but it was minus four degrees. Las Vegas is sort of built for this. And as a result, I think a lot of people have been having this marked on their calendar uh, for quite some time. Why are people coming to Vegas for the game? Obviously, the sports passion, the entertainment, really, you know, and, and it's just a great place to be. Um, for, for adults, it's an adult playground. People call it adult Disney World. So I would expect that this event to be a massive economic boom for the city of Las Vegas, which certainly took a massive hit during the pandemic, um, where tourism was sort of gutted out and is certainly seen a, a resurgence as of late. I was there for the CES show in, in January at a brand new hotel called the Fountain Blue, which is a beautiful facility. But you know, you can certainly see Las Vegas coming back to life and more venues opening up there. And it feels like they're finally fully recovered. In fact, Las Vegas had record uh, revenues in gaming and gambling in the month of December um, of 2023. So it feels like they're coming back and they really are expecting a massive economic boost in the city of Las Vegas, a city that certainly deserves it uh, after what they've been through uh, during the pandemic. So in terms of people who can't go to Las Vegas, I unfortunately, um, was only going to go if my Philadelphia Eagles made the Super Bowl, and that was a short-lived dream this year. Um, but 30% of people are going to host Super Bowl parties at home, and I like those people will be watching at home um, this year. So again, it's a, it's a time when people like to get other people together. And in terms of what people buy when they're watching it at home and hosting, pizza and beer, I know it's kind of cliche, but that's what people get during the Super Bowl. Um, I had the CMO of Domino's Pizza um, on the podcast recently. It hasn't come out yet, but he told me that there are these massive occasions where they drive so much volume, and the Super Bowl is one of them. And really, every Sunday during the NFL season is, is a huge business time for for companies like Domino's that that sell and deliver pizza, as well as beer companies. Now, you know, there is a lot of pressure on that sector, the beer sector. Um, I read this week that non-alcoholic beer is the fastest growing type of beer right now. Um, lots of reasons driving that, which we can get into. But, um, you know, th that being said, it's still a huge volume driver um, for that category. And where they're buying is Walmart and Target. Um, no surprise. Why not Amazon? Why isn't that popping up? I believe it's because people probably wait for the last minute um, and they, maybe you're going to pick up stuff for the game that day. And although Amazon has some same day delivery, that's kind of the one place where Walmart and Target um, can really win given their you know, the physical location infrastructure, which is why you see a lot of consumers naming Walmart and Target um, and not Amazon. So what are they watching? So it's sort of even across the board in terms of the game, the halftime show and the commercials. Um, I know that, that these numbers really vary based upon who you're talking to, male versus female, um, age, obviously sports fan versus non-sports fan. But there are really are three parts of the game that people watch. They watch the game itself. They, they like the halftime show. It is sort of that 
unifying cultural moment that people like to talk about, a lot of water cooler discussion the Monday after the game about what people thought about the halftime show, um, and of course the commercials, which we will certainly be getting into today. Um, the halftime show itself brings its own economic boost um, to the performer. The performers actually do not get paid to perform um, during halftime, but it has so much ancillary benefit. So you can see um, when Rihanna performed, she saw nearly a 40% boost um, in sales of, of, of her um, albums and streaming platforms after Super Bowl halftime performance because the audience is unparalleled. You know, you're talking about over 100 million people. So Usher, who's this year's performer, just has an incredible opportunity to um, really pour gasoline on the fire of his career and get incredible exposure during the Super Bowl. Obviously, brands are are in the Super Bowl um, and they're they're there in a big way. Um, one thing I read this morning is one of the largest categories this year is um, the candy and sweets category. So there's a record number of candy and sweets brands that are advertising. Um, there's six confirmed brands: M and M, Lint, Nerds, Drumstick, Reese's, and Oreos. Um, and it's a modern day high in the, in in terms of Super Bowl presence. Um, at the same time, you're seeing slightly less advertising, um, you know, from brands in the beer space. So they are spending less, given maybe some of the broader pressures uh, that the, that they're seeing. Um, and there's a flat interest from the auto industry. So um, the auto industry obviously um, is an industry that really took off post pandemic, right? You know, in the 21, 22 time period. But there is rising costs, um, both of financing and of raw materials that are impacting the automotive sector. They're also dealing with a lot of disruption from electronic vehicles. So you know, when you look at Super Bowl advertisers. A lot of times it's a great proxy for the market at large and really who's winning and who's not. And, you know, as I look across this, you obviously see entertainment companies. Um, you do see Verizon, who we're going to have a guest from uh, coming up very shortly. And um, tech companies like Google uh, participate. Um, and you can see DraftKings and Vandal. And we're going to talk about gambling, but gambling is and that MGM. So those are three major uh, gambling platforms that they're advertising during the Super Bowl. So going back to gambling once being taboo it's certainly not anymore uh, because the nfl is allowing these brands to advertise during the super bowl the nfl did say that if you were in las vegas and you work for the league whether you're a player or you work in the front office you are not allowed to even play blackjack in las vegas until the game's over so a lot of mixed messages coming out from the league um but there's no doubt that the fastest growing industry um that's tangential to sports uh is gambling um, in terms of sport, the commercials themselves, 42% of people resonate with humorous commercials. You know, I remember a couple of years ago, a lot of the commercials are really serious and it got a lot of backlash because people don't want to think about serious stuff during the Super Bowl. It's kind of a time to escape, which is why humor um, is what people really resonate towards even more so than celebrity endorsements. Celebrities are just a lot more accessible these days. Um, you know, before the, before the social media boom, you could only see celebrities you know, on video during the, the TV shows or movies that they were in. Uh, now we can access celebrities on video on TikTok or Instagram um, or any social platform 24 seven. So they're just far more accessible right now. And because of that, the power of them appearing in a new form factor, like a Super Bowl spot, is just not nearly as appealing as it used to. Now, that's not to say it's not effective. A lot of brands are still doing it. Um, this year's Super Bowl will be littered with celebrities. But at the same time, that's probably why you're seeing data like this come out of our own research. So do, do the commercials work? Do they have a lasting uh, impact? Um, well, nearly 50% said they're unlikely to purchase a product or service from a Super Bowl spot they saw. Um, and nearly the same percent said they uh, will be discussing the ads with family and friends. It's funny because, you know, we'll be talking to, to Jameson from Adweek, but everyone acts like they work for Adweek during the Super Bowl. Everyone acts like that they are an advertising expert and they can analyze the TV spot and why they did it and what worked and what didn't. And it's really the only, it's really the Super Bowl for advertising as well. Uh, for sure, traditional advertising in the 30 second spot, which is dying. You know, a lot of brands are shifting their spend away from 30 second spots to platforms like TikTok, platforms where the consumer is to more direct marketing on Google and Facebook, obviously. And, you know, so this is a real great moment for the traditional 30 second kind of television industrial complex. It is the Super Bowl for advertising. Um, nearly 40% or over 40% said they're likely to look up a brand online after the commercial ran. Um, and 40% said they made a purchase from a past Super Bowl ad. So obviously the Kansas City Chiefs made it. And, you know, 
I'm sure the NFL wasn't mad about that because as we all know, um, you know, there's a very prolific relationship between Kansas City Chiefs star Travis Kelsey and the biggest pop star in this country. Um, and probably one of the biggest pop stars um, of all time when you think about the economic power she's brought, uh, Taylor Swift. And Taylor, despite the fact that she has a concert in Tokyo the night before, uh, given the wonders of, of the time zone change and, and the ability to have a private jet, Taylor will be at the Super Bowl. And, you know, she is the most popular celebrity in, in America right now. So to have her kind of star power rubbing off on the Super Bowl. And I'm really curious to think what, uh, hear what Marcus Collins, um, who is the expert on culture, has to say about this. Um, I do think it just brings so much more notoriety, um, so much more interest across a broader base. Um, as I mentioned earlier, women are huge NFL fans. It is the most watched live program um, every year on TV is the NFL across not just men, but female viewers. But obviously, Taylor Swift brings a whole nother audience, um, not just more people across genders, but younger people and people that aren't interested in the Super Bowl at all, just to get a glimpse of her. Some people don't like it. Some people think they show her too much during games. But one thing's for certain, everybody is talking about it. Um, and it's going to add another element to this year's game, which I think will contribute to this probably being the most watched Super Bowl we've ever seen. So trend predictions. First and foremost, betting, as I mentioned earlier, is huge. 40% of consumers are likely to bet on this year's games with bets topping um, $1.3 billion. So these are Americans coming up, at, you know, and, and I read last year in the state of New York, over $12 billion was bet on games. This does not come without its problems, obviously. Gambling addiction is a real thing. Um, the accessibility of betting on sports 24-7 has had, I think, um, negative impacts on a lot of consumers, but it's legalized in so many states. Now it's kind of here to stay. Um, there's even stadiums that are building, um, you know, betting facilities within stadiums. Um, younger consumers, much younger consumers are getting involved in it. Um, and it is a huge driver of engagement. It makes people watch games they wouldn't normally watch and care about players they wouldn't normally care about. And I think this year you're going to see an explosion, um, kind of like the mother of all um, gambling opportunities for these large platforms like FanDuel and DraftKings and BetMGM, which is exactly why they're advertising not to mention the games in Vegas. Um, social engagement, obviously, and we've seen this for, for many years now, will be a partner to linear TV during the big game. The big moment when social media overlap with um, the Super Bowl was, um, I believe it was 2014 when there was a blackout during the game and Oreo, you know, very smartly instantly made this post um, that you can dunk in the dark. Um, you know, they, they made it right away um, to promote Oreo and post it on Twitter. And that was sort of a defining moment, uh, sort of the omni-channel approach that advertisers need to take during the Super Bowl, where it's not just about the spot, but it's about all the other media channels surrounding the Super Bowl. Um, and, you know, if you are an advertiser, you need to think about social engagement and how you're going to leverage this in social media as a core part of your overarching strategy. Um, so you're going to have real time multi channel ad campaigns. You're going to see, you know, just much more attribution with brands. Obviously, we are in a different economic environment now than we were in 2021, despite the fact that the stock market is booming. Um, you know, there's a lot of concerns about rising debt loads with the consumer. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty within this election year, um, a lot of macroeconomic and social political issues that create a lot of uncertainty for a lot of businesses right now. Not to mention inflation is still a real thing. That being said, you have record low um, unemployment rates and the consumer is holding up really strong, but attribution is key. And a lot of brands want to know how is this investment driving volume? especially more sophisticated CPG companies, which have really mastered that game of tracking attribution of, of TV spots to volume in the product. And as we mentioned, comedy is really key. So consumers want comedy and you know we'll see if they'll get it. So I'd love to invite now um, our awesome panel to join on stage, um, on the virtual stage, Ricardo, uh, Dr. Marcus Collins, Jameson, uh, please uh, join in and we'll, we'll dive into a discussion. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Just fine. All right. Well, let's, so, let's dive in. Um, Mark, as I mentioned you during the presentation, and, and so great to have you back um, with us. Um, what are your thoughts on this whole Taylor Swift, um, you know, Travis Kelsey, on-field, off-field romance? And what does it mean for the cultural implications of the Super Bowl at large? Well, there are a few things at play. First of all, thanks so much for having me here. Of course. Uh, a few things at play. 
one, it's a great drama. I mean, it's, it's just a great, it's a great, it's a great additional story to what's going on, which creates an invitation for people who aren't invested in the game. Perhaps, you know, their team made it to the NFC championship, but didn't make it to uh, the Super Bowl. And our hearts were broken as a city, Detroit, uh, yeah. but still want to feel invested in, in the game. Uh, this, this story, the Taylor Swift story invites more people in. And to your point, it creates greater media wattage to what is already the biggest media moment in the, in the country. And one would say the Super Bowl need any additional help. Well, I think, I, I don't think anyone Super Bowl will say, Hey, we don't want more attention on what we do for people who normally wouldn't be engaged with the sport, wouldn't be engaged with the game. may just say, I just want to see what's kind of going on because I either care about Taylor, maybe I'm a Swifty or I'm just sort of caught in, caught up into the story. That is these two, uh, their, their romance and, and, and where it may go. Yeah, absolutely. Any thoughts on that, um, Jameson, in terms of like, you know, you're that week, you're tracking what brands are doing, you know, how does kind of the cultural relevance of the Super Bowl impact the way that brands go about the creative approach? And like, how does the moment uh, in any given time impact the way they want to leverage this opportunity? Yeah. And before I answer that, I want to add one thing to what Marcus said. We just got some data that was sent to us that said, Fans of Taylor Swift have quadrupled their spending on the NFL since the two of them started dating, wow. which is, you know, a, a phenomenal stat. Uh, but to, to answer your question, I mean, you know, brands need to make their moment during the game. If you're going to spend, you know, if you look at something like Michelob, Michelob spent probably eight to $10 million on Messi, a few, few million dollars on Jason Sudeikis, Dan Marino, a minute of their time production. I mean, that's like a $30 million investment in one ad probably. And so you have to really understand that this is a full campaign, that this is, if you're going to make a moment in culture that people are going to appreciate and remember, like it can't just be 30 seconds or 60 seconds in the Super Bowl. You have to be really thought out about how you lead up to it, how you get out of it. And that's something that, you know, we were talking before this, like Sarah V with Michael Sarah has nailed to a T. They understood culture. They understood how to put in with the right influencers to get everybody talking about that brand. Made people think it was probably a Super Bowl ad. And then yesterday they revealed that, yes, this is all part of the Super Bowl. And so they understood culture so incredibly well because they knew exactly what pot what influencers have put him with to make a splash yeah i mean, I mean this is so powerful though if i could just jump in on that first we of all that, that data point is crazy i think it's so powerful because taylor swift didn't tell anybody to buy anything in fact when she went to that first game she wasn't even wearing a travis kelsey jersey but jersey sales went up well why is that because people who self-identify as a Swifty, a part of that community, they're negotiating, constructing what it means to be in this community and what people like us do. And therefore, it is exemplified, personified through consumption. And to James' point, that this idea of brands being a part of culture is sort of like, you know, we're making this massive investment to tap into this moment that everyone's watching shoulder to shoulder, like con concurrently watching the thing shoulder to shoulder. And they can talk about it with a, a shorthand, like the big game, as if everyone watches the game, right? Only a third of the country watches the game. But that, con that concurrence of that shared social moment, the brand has to say, are we doing something that's beyond just the 30 seconds that become a part of the discourse that is negotiated and constructed among people and ergo, uh, manifested in the way that they consume. I, mean, yeah. I think also creatively, if you think about how it changed just the the viewership, right? The people that are actually experiencing the NFL experience. Let's not talk about just the Super Bowl. Let's talk about like the whole season, right? So when you think about like the programs and creatives and things and ideas that were sort of like crafted before, I'm not saying they were obviously just for a male audience, but they were highly skewed for that. And sure. it happened with the Swift moment. It's like, wait, there's a much younger female, broader generation now tuning into these games. My messages as a brand need to be much more current, right? So that they actually capitalize on that new sort of like enhanced viewership. So I think it has changed a little bit about how we approach the partnerships during the season, approaching the Super Bowl, and then obviously during the big game. Yeah, so Ricardo, I want to click into that because, you know, as Jameson said, 30 million investment, you know, you're with Verizon. First of all, I'd love to hear a little bit about your role at Verizon. And then 
a little bit about what process Verizon goes through to decide if you're going to advertise or not. Because obviously, there's a lot of other places you can put that much money. Um, and especially in the world of AI and, and programmatic advertising, a case we made that you should send that spend that on lower funnel, where you can have a much more, I guess, guaranteed path of, of attribution and, and return on investment. So would love to hear first on your role at Verizon and, and then what that decision making process is like. Yeah, so I, I am I, I am the VP of creative at Verizon. What I do is I oversee creative and messaging from strategy to development to execution to go to market for uh, the four work streams of our organization. So on consumer, business, brand, and then everything in terms of like CSR and, and, and all that kind of stuff, right? So all the creative sort of like paid advertising goes through my team, my organizations, and I obviously work with a suite of agencies to deliver on those strategies. So that's that's sort of like my role. Um, now, to answer the question is like, listen, as a big brand, especially a brand like Verizon, who has a obviously exclusive partnership with the NFL, it's important for us to always capitalize on the partnership because the access and the platform that we get through that partnership, it's obviously a, a huge, right? And we, we're gonna make sure that we, we, we enhance that. Um, again, it's not just the game, it's the whole NFL sort of like season and preseason and everything uh, in terms of programming and, and entertainment that comes out of the NFL, like Sunday ticket, et cetera, right? Why is important for us, uh, especially this moment, in, it's, it's, it's a little bit because all stars are aligning. The first thing is this is happening in Vegas, right? Vegas is the entertainment and sports capital of the world, right? The way that we activate it is through partnership with Live Nation, entertainment, music, artists, our sort of like whole suite of like partners. If you think of Paramount, of HBO Max, Netflix, everything that we do now that, that goes through the pipeline that happens on this phone and that we offer our customers is about entertainment. So it makes total sense for us to sort of like be in Vegas and activate fully, not only in terms of this phantom that goes behind football, but the fandom that goes behind all the entertainment industry, which is obviously a close tight partnership with Verizon that our customers already experience, but also expect for Verizon to kind of like be the pipeline that delivers that experience to an optimal level. So this is why it makes sense for us to be in this moment, capitalize it to its max. Yes, the big game is important. Yes, the TV spot is important, but for us, it's sort of like the whole surrounding component and everything that happens from on the ground to under stores to the experiences that we deliver in Vegas and outside of Vegas, what makes the whole program purposeful and meaningful and obviously worth the money. Absolutely. And when you talk about, you know, building a TV spot, you know, in this day and age, you know, it used to be about just pushing your, your your unique selling points of a product. Like we have 350 horsepower, we are more 20% more absorbent, you know, like our Pentium chip runs faster. And now you don't see any of that anymore. I see Marcus smirking because that is ultimately the shift between the advertising kind of Mad Men era of advertising and content. And now we almost completely see content, things that you would watch maybe on YouTube, even if it wasn't during a game, you know, is that, is that shift here to stay and, and what's driving that and, and how should brands, if you, Marcus, were, you know, you were, you were running a major brand and you were told you have to spend on the Super Bowl, what would you do? So there's a, there's a scholar here at Michigan who, who passed some years ago, his name is CK Prahalad, and he had this idea called the dominant logic. And the idea of the dominant logic is sort of the status quo of how we see things. And because of the status quo, we tend to act in a consistent way. But innovation, uh, uh, new ideas, creativity are always on the opposite side of the, do the dominant logic. So we have to challenge the dominant logic. So the dominant logic is often like, hey, during the year, we are marketing to heavy lifting, preach the value propositions, a razor sharper, battery lasts longer, car goes faster. I mean, the Super Bowl, well, now let's have some fun. Super Bowl, this isn't about how do we move units, at least directly. This is about making connections. And if we connect with people in a meaningful way, then they will consume. Which says to me, if I were challenging the dominant logic, well, if the theory is that connections lead people to consume, why aren't we trying to connect all year round? Round. Like, what, why is it that we wait for this moment to, Jameis's point, invest $30 million to make a connection, but then everything else, every other, you know, 364 days of the year, we're just throwing value propositions, hoping, praying, inshallah, that people will say, you know what, I do want 25% more Florida in my toothpaste. I'm buying your toothpaste. <laughs> right? So my take would be, 
let's look at our marketing mix through the theoretical lens of we make connections and connections drive consumption such that from a programmatic or let's say an, an episodic point of view that the marketing communication sort of crescendos at the Super Bowl so that to, to Jameis's earlier point that the campaign isn't just this one spot. Right. But this is just it's one chapter in a broader a narrative, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It just the Super Bowl is when you know you beat Bowser, right, or whatever you know kind of climax of some movie. But it's a story that the brand is telling, such that we're able to drive, make connections. To Ricardo's point, that it ultimately drives commerce, and we know this intuitively, but we tend to not think sort of as humans when we're in the marketing seat until this this moment where we can have some fun. And I think some of the best ads do manage to do both of entertain, but also pitch the product. I mean, if you look at E-Trade, those babies every year walk you through the product in some entertaining way. Uh, you know, Ricardo's counterparts over at T-Mobile, while those ads aren't always the most entertaining, they've gone the same script with, uh, you know, Zach, uh, uh, Zach Braff and Donald Faison, where they sing through a product and it has to be working to some extent or they won't keep doing that same formula. And then even on the Verizon side, if I remember correctly, the cable guy ad you did two years ago was pretty much a product demo, if I remember correctly. And so that ad was entertaining, but it was also a product demo. And so right. we often when you see celebrities involved in the game, the best ones are often the ones where they do actually somehow pitch the product instead of just entertain you for the most part. I think yeah, it's, it's a false bifurcation that we use that's like either has to do this or do that. Yeah. Those two things can work in concert. I mean, one of my favorite ads of all time happened to be a Super Bowl ad that the lore says it only ran once, 1984, right? And Apple 1984, they didn't talk about value propositions, but they talk about a point of view of the brand that was going to be manifested, uh, exemplified in the products. And people who saw the world similarly to Apple goes, oh, that's my kind of brand, yeah. right? Like that. Right. And it drives consumption, but also that the investment that was made, uh, you know, hiring Ridley Scott, also paying for uh, the media time, which wasn't expensive relative to where we are today, right? Expensive for what it was then, that we still talk about this thing some, you know, 40 years later, right? Like it's more than just a moment in time. And it does not have to not talk about the products, but it has to be driven uh, with the mindset of connection. So Ricardo, does, does this all jive with how you look at creative at Verizon? And with that, like, what does the briefing process look like when you're going to your agency partners and you're asking them to pitch you ideas on what to run during the Super Bowl? It's interesting because I think a big transition from cable guy to like, for example, like the evolution of what you guys are going to see on Sunday, it's cable guy was a product demo because it was a product that never existed before. And the brief was like, make people understand how Wi-Fi actually works in your house without a router. You know what I mean? So like in order to deliver that message, it couldn't just be some like quick, funny type of awareness driver kind of thing. You have to make people believe that this actually broke the norm, right? Which is why we bring Cable Guy. And it's exactly why Donald Faison and Zach Braff sung about it. It's because there was no other way to explain it that to actually be a little bit detailed on it. Now, great, the awareness, the driving, people understood it. You move forward from that. But I, I agree with Marcus that that's, that's probably an orchestration that can only happen a few times. I don't think that can be the way that brands show up, especially in moments like this, when it's always like, let me take you through something really new. I'm going to entertain you. But you know what I mean? So like, I think for us, it's like this year was like, first of all, like we have already one great thing that we always want to talk about. And that is like, that we're the number one network in America and that we are the, like, you know, that reliability matters, right? But right. we also are like, all right, we've been doing that like by touching people's heartstrings, like making it, you think like, you know what I mean? Like night one, one call is important. And sort of like, we have kind of like worked on that. And this year it was like, we wanna convey the same example of like, you know, network superiority, but let's do it in a way that is ultra simple, that is insanely entertaining, that is culturally electric. You know what I mean? That, 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 we have to commit to big and we have to make sure that it's a little bit of a surprise party, meaning mm -hmm. unexpected. You know what I mean? So that was that brief. It's like, we want something that people are going to see there and be like, 
holy shit, is that Verizon? Because that's the kind of message that we want to make sure that people get, you know what I mean? So like that was the brief, but the brief more than anything going a little bit against my cable guy strategy was it needs to be ultra simple and it needs to stay in one message that people are going to take away and come back and say, I remember Verizon because of this. So that was a little bit of the brief, everything, all the logistical things that happen after moving the pieces. I will leave it for uh, another conversation because we can talk about hours of that. But but I would tell you, it was it was it was an idea that would be very culturally connected. That was the main thing. And the second one, the simplicity of the message. We were not here to over explain. We were right. not here to over deliver. We were not here to take you through a product demo. That was not yeah. Yeah, because you know, for a second there, Ricardo, I, I thought you were about to tell us what you're going to do on Sunday. Uh, I thought I, just for a moment there, I thought you were about to have it yesterday. Oh, yeah. We're waiting a little bit more. Yes. Trust me, I've been trying to get this out of him and his team for weeks now, and they will not budge. Period. For a moment so, there, no. I thought, I thought for a moment, just for a moment there. <laughs> so speaking of, I guess, keeping your creative quiet until the game, and this is a question that uh, Nirne, who's part of our audience right now asked is, you know, and I, James said, love your thoughts on this, is why have we increasingly started to see advertisers release their commercials ahead of the Super Bowl? Because like you got, we were talking about this before the webinar today, and I refuse to watch it because I like seeing it for the first time during the Super Bowl, but we're seeing a lot of brands get ahead of it. Why, why do you think that is? Yeah, so I kind of bucket Super Bowl ads into two groups. One that is trying to have a shocking moment on Saturday, which is or Sunday, which I think is what we're probably going to get out of Verizon and a number of a, a number of other ads. Um, in total, there's about 60 advertisers on Ad Week right now. We have 36 full ads that you can go view, um, and we only expect to see a few more before Sunday. And so the majority of the ones that we haven't seen are ones that we know are trying to have a moment on Sunday where they're going to cut through, they're going to shock you, and it's going to be unbelievable. That other 40 ads, two-thirds of the game, they're not trying to have a moment. They're trying to have just a strong ad that you'll hopefully remember. And if you're going to invest all the tens of millions of dollars in them, you want to get as much attention in advance as you possibly can. And so, uh, you know, for some of these ads will be aired on Good Morning America, Today Show, other nationally broadcast, you know, things where they actually have a segment. It's not like they're running during a commercial break. They actually talk about the ad. And so it's it just generates so much more hype. And if you're a brand that shows up at a Super Bowl party, so all the candy brands, the chip brands, the drink brands, you're now also hope, hoping to get consumers to buy your brand for your Super Bowl party because you're putting them top of mind. So you're not just driving sales after the game, you're driving sales for Super Bowl Sunday. And so that's why you kind of see a lot of brands go early because you know it's a much longer you know funnel for them and much a lot of different things at play for them. And I would imagine, I mean, Ricardo, I would imagine as part of the campaign for Verizon, it's very much part of the discussion. We're not going to talk about this, or we are going to talk about that, because it's almost like theater, and it's part of the storytelling. Yeah, and I think for us, the only thing I can tell you is that saving the the, the, the creative of the spot for the game is not just about being, you know, cautious or anything. It's because it has a bigger purpose that is beyond just the creative, right? And I think to going back to Marcus' point about like, how do you really connect this to culture? There's a lot of things in culture that you have to wait for. Um, and that's sort of like what we're tapping into here. Interesting. All right, so a little clue there, Jameson, that, you know, he didn't give you, he give you a little bit. So as a reporter, you'll have to kind of interpret what that means. But uh, so uh, Marcus, I mean, one big part that we see as a constant during the Super Bowl is nostalgia. So you have like your Budweiser's kind of Clydesdale uh, dog combo, which you almost see every single year. You have your Coors Light, Silver Bullet Train, things that kind of people remember for when they were younger seeing during the Super Bowl. Why is nostalgia important? And has the impact of nostalgia kind of evolved over the years with you know, kind of these new consumers? It's interesting, you know, nostalgia used to be considered an illness, a disease. Right, that these you couldn't get over the past because of how weighted we were to the past, and we now look at nostalgia through a romantic lens because it takes us back. Um, and, and we can see this just as last just last week, last weekend at the the Grammys. You know, Tracy Chapman sings "Fast Car." People go, "Oh, I remember it so vividly when I." 
first heard that song or I sang that song over and over and over in the 90s, like, you know, it brings us back. And it's the bring us back that actually connects us, oddly. That you go, you let us talk to, I let us talk to, let me tell you about it. And it begins to, it, it invites stories. It invites mythology and lore. And it's through the shared ideologies and beliefs that are communicated through stories that we find connection. You know, it, McDonald's is another great example of this. Like, oh, when I was a kid, I used to go to birthday parties, have the, the high sea orange and the cooler, the igloos. Like we just find ourselves, we find the humanity in that. And I think that a moment like the Super Bowl, we're watching this game shoulder to shoulder with folks and we could find those connections. It makes a social event actually feel even more social, not just because we're rooting for the same team in, in the room, but even those interstitials that would typically be moments where we go get, you know, refills in our soda that we're sitting together, experiencing it together. It makes the game that much more uh, social and tribal by nature. Yeah, I would also imagine like when you talk about brands like Budweiser and Coors Light and McDonald's, you know, they have heritage and history on their side. Or like if you're FanDuel or DraftKings, like these new sports betting apps that just popped up, they don't have any nostalgia, right? So that's not an option for them. Maybe they so, – so they have to probably go in a different direction based upon just the, the nature of their business. Right. Or they use nostalgia in different ways. You know, Correct. like a, a, a Budweiser can use sort of their distinctive brand assets – as a way to signal nostalgia through like the Clyde sales, for instance, uh, where, you know, a new brand like a, a FanDuel doesn't have that luxury. So they tap into cultural nostalgia yeah. things. There are moments in time, contextual uh, 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 environments they could tap into. So you, I remember I was there and the brand becomes sort of tattooed to that moment through the way in which they communicate themselves. Yeah, yeah they, they've tapped into existing ip we actually haven't seen any of it this year which kind of shocks us but you know verizon did cable guy and gm did austin powers and last year pop right. corners did breaking bad so where maybe you don't have that nostalgia you can go find something yeah, from right the 90s right. or the 2000s that people are going to go nuts for and bring it with your brand but amazingly, not a single ad has tapped into that this Nothing. year yet. i i am uh, totally it's like this year has been zero borrowed nostalgia nostalgia ip Zero. What? You know, it's cool though. To, to to that end, you take a brand, a newer brand, like was that a Coinbase I was that did the about, bouncing yeah. QR uh, uh, QR code? That like, if you you know grew up in the '90s, you know what that is. Like that's the screensaver bouncing around, and it's sort of like if you know, you know. And they borrowed mm -hmm. that nostalgic sort of cultural nuance as a way to get people to lean in, right? Knowing how we socially watch the game, realizing this is a 60 second spot, which feels like forever doing the Super Bowl, especially if there's something just bouncing around. It's a QR code. So someone goes, what is that? Takes a photo. Then you have social proof where more people adopt it. And now you got the app going from number 169 in the app store to number two. Unbelievable. Yeah. And that's they a story, design right, for the right? that's a story without telling a story. That's right. 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 So I was going to bring up the corn base, so great minds think alike, I guess, right? Um, because that was one of the few spots I remember for the last couple of years because it was just, I just think it was so different. And, you know, you're, if you're, a lot of people are at a party and they just can't even hear the volume, right? So you see this thing on the screen, you're saying, what is that? And that's probably another thing that drives it. I mean, Jameson, you've been doing this for a while and, and, and you're looking at the Super Bowl spots. Like, what is common in when Super Bowl spots really take off and, and when Ad Week's doing its ratings um, and playing Monday morning quarterback? You know, what's most likely the case on the top rated ads? Or is it all over it's, the board? It's, I mean, it can be all over the board, but often the top one or two is something that broke the mold. So, it's a tight ad. The insight that everybody has clean clothes and a Super Bowl ad, which must mean everything has to be a laundry detergent ad. And that means Ty can take that moment. Utterly brilliant. Uh, you know, one that we were looking at this year is, and we had on the cover of the magazine last week, is DoorDash. Well, DoorDash now delivers everything. Well, that means they can deliver every item in the Super Bowl. So they're going to DoorDash one person 
every single item that you see advertised in a that's Super Bowl. A that's idea. four cars. That's Kawasaki, you know, sport utility vehicle. It's a pallet of peanut butter cups. I don't know what they're going to give away from Verizon. Probably they better hope that. both stream doesn't um, come in as so, a last second advertiser. Yeah, and so it's <laughs> it's brands who come up with a way to break the mold in a very fascinating and good way. I mean, we've seen a few that was like, oh, that didn't work. But most of the time when you try to do something totally new, it usually works. Yeah. So we got an interesting question from the audience from Ethan. He wrote, um, in the race atop and the cultural moments, is there any merit in going counterculture? So he brings up the example that, you know, while Taylor Swift might be bringing kind of non-hardcore sports fans, is there, is there a path to say we are for the real sports fan and kind of going against it and, and counterculture? Well, I guess any thoughts on, on a strategy like that, you know, because I think – Sometimes if you try to be everything to everybody, everybody, you're nothing to nobody sort of thing. So is there a path there? I think it's, my opinion is, is going against a, a, a very force of nature, which is the Swifties. And yeah. sort of like trying to knock them down. Dangerous territory, it's, right? It's a dangerous territory to walk into versus being as a brand, somebody that perhaps can do a better job building the bridge, perhaps in a more disruptive way. Uh, versus sort of like trying to kind of like draw that hard, hard line. I think there's already a lot of like division happening everywhere that oh, to come up sure. in a moment like it's this. And say, just like we are else. on this side right. and you are on this side and we are the hardcore and you are just the, you know, the influencer type of people or whatever. I, I, I don't know. I think it might be good perhaps for a different moment. It's a big risk. It can be arrestingly entertaining to watch, I'm sure. But I wonder how much that does from a brand a currency, right? Like yeah. how much of that gives you back? Yeah. But I think that I, I, I agree with you. I totally agree. And I also feel like, you know, it's risk that gets us to innovation is risk that gets us to, to, to new. Um, and in a world where like, everyone's like kind of sort of playing it safe for someone to preach the gospel in a way that is provocative, people who see the world similarly go, yeah, totally, absolutely. And now I'm going to go share that with other people who are just like me. Now, while this may not have been like terribly provocative, like it didn't poke the bear or work or counter anything, it certainly made a big statement uh, some years ago uh, imported from Detroit. And at the time, I was living in New York as a Detroiter, and I almost shed a tear when I saw that spot. Right. And what, every what brand was that? Do you, what, what brand? That was uh, Chrysler. Chrysler, right. And, yeah. And, uh, and so when I see the spot, like I, it, it became a way by which I talked about myself, right? And yeah. that, that's the best advertising. When the advertising moves from the brand talking about itself, but people use the marketing communication as cultural production to talk about themselves and people like them, that's when we move beyond the 30 second spot to becoming a part of the cultural discourse, right. i.e. the brand is now, you know, the, 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 the ad becomes, it becomes currency social currency between people like 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 us and that 30 second media window now becomes an, an ongoing thing yeah and it only happens when when it's when it is not uh what it what is not uh expected in like everything else i guess to ricardo's point the detroit ad is more raising detroit and people from detroit up without pushing anything else down so I yeah, think now, I here, definitely wouldn't throw shots at Swifties. That's just stupid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think in the in the in the question about the Swifties, I think the anti-Swiftie movement has also become so highly political. Exactly, yeah, like yeah. attaching yourself to it as a brand has that higher. Yeah, you it every country basically. So it's 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 something that I uh, answering the question as a Verizon. I don't know if I would go there. With yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's three groups of people you don't mess with. That yeah. are the Swifties, the Beehive, and the Barbs. That's right. Nicki Minaj's people. <laughs> just don't. Just stay away. Just, just stay away. Just yeah. Stay away. <laughs> so uh, another thing we're seeing this year, and it's you know it's been obviously creeping up for so, quite some time, is just influencers, you know, from the social media world getting brought into kind of. The, you know, the, the TV world. So you have, um, you know, TikToker as Zim Ray and Ice Spice and people who kind of got their start and obviously super um, appeal to the Gen Z audience being brought in to Super Bowl marketing efforts. Um, is this a shift that, you know, Jameson, you're, we're continuing to see and what other ways do you think TikTok plays a role 
because it's obviously so huge in terms of its popularity amongst the younger audiences. Yeah, we started to see more of it. As you said, there's there's a couple. Elf has, I can't remember the, the influence or the creator's name. It shows up in the Elf ad. Uh, you know, it, it's a risk because it's playing to a very specific demographic. Yeah, a lot of people are like, who's that? Right. Yeah, and so most people who are going to see the Nerds ad are going to have no idea who Addison Ray is, but also the nerds is trying to get gen gen z and maybe millennials to buy that candy and so maybe they don't care if the majority of the audience doesn't actually know who addison ray is and she only plays a minor part in the ad and so you might just think that's just some random person right and so when it's when the person is tied in and it's clear why they're there i think it makes sense and it also sometimes works in an ensemble where you know you can have that two second or three second you know, spotlight of that person. And, you know, the audience who doesn't know that person isn't going to think worse of the ad because I didn't recognize them, but it hits a certain demographic. It's so it's really just how they're used, which is really just how any other celebrity is, how they're used in an ad. Uh, you just have to be really thoughtful about it. I think the difference is, and, and it's a trend to keep up, watch and embrace is um, these influencers have incredibly a, 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 a opportunity to like expand the message out there right so whether it resonates yeah. with somebody the amplification that they provide it's like so unique and so organic and natural uh that you can't even compete with a pr agency on that this is why mm -hmm. you go to fashion shows and who's from row influencers no longer buyers no longer merchants no longer designers influencers right because that's the way that you get your brand and you get your message out there in the most like compelling massive way so I think we're going to start to see more and more of like leveraging these people, whether they are the main leads and their stars of something or part of it. This is the reason why perhaps Dunkin' Donuts last year was like, I spy as well. You know what? Let's just put her with Ben Affleck. Maybe that actually becomes like a little bit of the best of both worlds. And sort mm -hmm. of like you can see brands kind of like testing the waters like that. But I think we're going to see more and more of that because it's becoming extremely effective uh, for, for reach and awareness. Yeah, and these folks got bright wattage media. I mean, good night. Like they're not like nobodies. Like you're talking, right. millions of people follow them. <clears throat> so to to Ricardo's point, like you get the best of both worlds. You got people that everyone sort of knows, and then you got people that if you know, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. that has that has great cultural saliency. Like I, re yeah. I remember uh, back in the day, this was a Super Bowl spot, but but the Sprite Obey Your Thirst work, like to see Grand Pooba or. Pete Rock and CL Smooth that I know most of America did not know unless you were like way into hip hop in those early 90s. Like, I felt like you were talking to me. I felt seen by identifying people that most people don't know. And then let me know that the brand was sort of like me. They were fans like me. So understanding like the, the nuances of these kind of cultural communities and leveraging their bright wattage media to, to ripple within the community, people who see the world similarly, that's really powerful. Now you got media on top of media on top of media. If yeah. you're spending $30 million, you might as well optimize it as much as possible. Yeah, like having Addison Rae have a small part in the Super Bowl spot, you know, it almost like accomplishes both things because you're not betting the farm on the widespread, you know, knowledge of her. Um, but That's the right. people who know her see it. And then you get her entire amplification at the same That's time. Right. So I think it's a great strategy to, yeah. doing it that way. So um, just to wrap up here, you know, this year and last year, obviously, and, and hanging this year, it's age of AI. And, you know, AI is such a big Im impact on the advertising industry. And it strikes me that the Super Bowl is one of those moments that at least until now is sort of AI proof, because I don't know if AI is ever going to be driving um, people on the football field. You know, real humans will always be playing football, uh, at least as far as I know. Um, so you're watching real humans on a real field, and these are spots that, generally are an AI generated and like so many of the long tail digital ads that we see, they're made by great creatives on Madison Avenue and, and with real celebrities, et cetera. How long are we before AI starts to, however, creep into the world of sports or television advertising um, in all of your opinions? And let, let's start with you, Ricardo. I think AI, it's already uh, part of it. Uh, yeah. Especially when you think about like the production nuances of how you make things happen with like zero time, which is what probably all, all of us that work in advertising have. But uh, I will tell you for this Super Bowl, we are uh, uh, using AI significantly, especially for our um, 
our uh, Latino and Hispanic uh, program that we're doing with Univision, which is wow. actually the first, the first Super Bowl uh, that is going to be narrated and aired in a Spanish-speaking uh, network. Um, and we have partnered with J Balvin uh, for that effort. And what we're doing is an incredible experience surrounding that moment that leverages AI in a way that you would never imagine uh, would have been possible, not even last year. So it's already in, and it's already in as a way to keep the momentum, keep the engagement, and keep the dialogue open, something that perhaps we were doing with people behind a computer today. Now it's happening in the wild, and it's becoming extremely organic, right? It's like, you know, you remember that movie, Her? Of course. It's a little bit like that. You know, it's like, oh, shit, this is this feels real and really scary. Yeah. Also. So um, it's here, and I think it's here to stay, and I think we are embracing it already. Oh, it's certainly here to stay. Jameson, Marcus, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen it used too much in the creative. There's a Body Armor regional ad that apparently uses AI that I, I need to check out yet. But in terms of like the actual creative that we're going to see on Sunday, there's very little. I think that's going to change in the next few years. I think you're going to see a lot of it. Uh, but for now, I think everybody's still a little hesitant to put it on that big of a stage uh, so boldly, but we're going to get there. And somebody, some brand is going to be damn proud of the fact that they're going to have the first AI generated Super Bowl ad and it's going to get pitched in my inbox for weeks. I know it's coming. Right. That will almost be the idea. Yes, exactly. Right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually curious to see what ads actually tackle AI as a topic. Uh, uh, yeah. this week, if they are at all. Like, I could see AI point. being sort of a joke, right? Sort of a foil, if you will, in some of the, the, the spots as a way to sort of see, like, to spark the discourse. Like, are we open for this? Are we down to do this? And do we have an appetite for it to actually be a part of the, the creation process? I mean, I think, Ricardo, I think that the fact that you all are thinking about this and embracing it says a lot about uh, uh, your your disposition uh, for technology as a creative driver, it does, makes a lot of sense because you guys are Verizon. So, of course, you would be embracing technology in this way. Uh, but it takes folks like you all to take the first step for us to really uh, have a, a much better uh, appetite and, and, and a much better disposition about the role that AI plays in creative. We've been using it in marketing already with, with, with chatbots and the alike. Uh, but the generative AI is still sort of the, the, the jury still out. But taking steps forward leads us to, to at least having more discourse about whether or not where people like us would do something like this. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the closest I think we're getting to it this year is Microsoft's whole ad is about its AI pilot, co-pilot, yeah, co -pilot, yeah. uh, which, I mean, they don't even really show off the AI, AI that much. I kind of expect it to come away from that ad being like, oh my God, look at Microsoft's AI. And it, they don't really put it front and center the way you maybe thought they would. Right. Cool. So we're, we're out of time here. So I want to just very quickly go around and get a prediction for the game. It wouldn't be a prediction um, oriented webinar without actually talking about the game. So Jameson, who's going to win? Oh man, I don't even watch football anymore. I'm going to, I'll say the 49ers. That means you're probably right. If you don't watch football, that means your prediction will probably be right. Cause everyone who does usually gets it wrong. So 49ers, Ricardo. I, I'm with 49ers as well. Marcus. I can't say 49ers. They broke my city's heart. So I got to go with the Chiefs, man. I would, argue that, I would argue that the Lions did it to themselves, but that's a, that's a whole nother webinar. Because um, <laughs> uh, I was pulling for you guys. Um, I'll take the 49ers as well. So uh, we're out of time. Guys, this has been amazing. Um, I can't wait for the broad audience to see it. I want to thank James and Ricardo, Marcus, for joining. Until uh, next time, we'll see you soon, everyone. Enjoy the game Sunday. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.